Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines. We are broadcasting live from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. Today's special guest won the Super Bowl a few years ago with the Seattle Seahawks and currently plays with the Philadelphia Eagles. He is one of the most dominant defensive players in the NFL, and he also makes a huge positive impact off the field with his amazing foundation. He is Michael Bennett, and today we are going beyond football. Hey, Michael, great hey, having you on the show today. Thank you, thank you. It was fun watching this last Super Bowl with you, but I know that it was killing you not to be in that game. It was killing me, and my body didn't have to feel any aches at the same time, <laughs> but at the same time, um, I just like I said, I, I really love you know the game of football as far as like understanding the, the nuances of it, how it's played, the amount of work people put into it, the amount of sacrifice and the amount of dedication that each individual player puts into it and then what a team puts in and brings it together yeah. and how we have a, a mantra of what we believe in together and we go out there and accomplish something together and I think um, football just breaks a lot of different barriers when it comes to that. It's the kind of place where we play a sport um, regardless of our religion, regardless of our political beliefs. On that Sunday, our gender, our color, we believe that we have the same goal and I think um, if life was like that, it would be a lot better, you know, but at the same time, it. football is one of those things where um, you always go back to that. You love that person next to you because you know the type of person he is and the character. And also the thing about um, being in those games and you learn so much from somebody else, you learn a little bit more. And watching Tom Brady and the rest of those guys play, you get a little jealous because you know what it feels like to be out there on that Sunday when it's Super Bowl time. That's because you were there. You yeah. want it. You want, you're a Super Bowl champion. Yeah, you know what Super it feels champion. like. Yeah. 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 Now, you grew up in, you were born in, New Orleans? No, uh, hey, man, it's a small, small town. Oh, wow. 10,000. In Louisiana. In Louisiana, yeah. And then you grew up in Texas. I grew up in Texas, yeah. And when did you start playing football? Um, I, had, I don't know. Maybe I had a, a football in my cradle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the times I remember mostly is like, you know, the times where the, the sport felt so pure it was when I was in my grandfather's house and he was a farmer and yep. we had a big line. And, um, I love, we used to play football and I, we used to try to mimic the guys we loved. And for me, the guys I loved growing up was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which I didn't know that I would be playing for them in the future, yeah. uh, you know, one day. And um, and the, I loved Warren Sapp, I loved Greg Spires, I loved Booger McFarlane, I loved Rondé Barber, you know, you know, Derek Brooks. Legends. Uh, legends, you know, all these guys. And, and um, to have an opportunity to, you know, eventually play for the organization, but just playing the sport and having just those people that I looked up to and like, it's like, oh, I'm Warren sat right here. Yeah. You know, I, um, I'm coming off the edge, edge like that. And uh, Simeon Rice, and that's when I just loved that. Playing football early in my grandpa's yard and playing tackle football before we knew about concussions. And yeah, things. yeah, before that. <laughs> now, your mom and dad, Michael Sr. and Penny, yeah. they, what, what did you learn from them through these years? I think I learned from my mom's, obviously, uh, she was a teacher, so my dad was, he worked in uh, technology, so I think I learned a lot from them as far as, actually, they're holding the wrong ball in there now that I look at I that. know. <laughs> <laughs> Only I would catch that. It says Buccaneers versus the Saints, but maybe, you know, but I learned from my parents about dedication, and, and, and um, I was inspired by my, the amount of time my mom put into her job, I think. Watching my mom as a, a kid and seeing her, you know, most teachers, I always, I always say, most teachers, when it's done, that day's done, they live on their life. But my mom always cared about the students beyond just her job. And I think for me, seeing that type of dedication to your craft or dedication to the people around you, um, it really, um, really helped me grow as an individual. And, and seeing my dad, my dad was always known as the neighborhood dad who cared. He was always did a lot of things. And so looking at him and learning how to be a father and learning how to be parents is something that I was really grateful for to know that my parents were really outstanding parents. Yeah. Oh, it makes sense. And you're, you're an outstanding father. You have yeah. a beautiful family, yeah. your wife, Pele, and you have three girls. Yeah. What values are you trying to instill in your three girls? I think I, for me, I just want to teach them the, you know, empathy and, and compassion for other people. I think a lot of times it's, you know, in this generation where things are all about self-gratification and the Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and things are happening around them, 
how can I teach them about empathy and understanding other people and understanding other people's beliefs and understanding who they are and how can they contribute to society in a possible, I mean, in the most, in the most awesomest way possible because they love awesome when I say awesome to them, yeah. <laughs> awesome kids. But those are things I really want to instill in them and having some beliefs in themselves and understanding you know, they're women and on top of that, um, they're a minority because they're women and then on top of that, they're black women and, and they have a certain amount of you know, things that they have to, barriers that they have to break through and that they have that power because they have a father who, you know, who believes in them, not because they're just their kids, but because of the type of people that they are growing up to be every single day. And yeah. I try to instill that into them, you know, have empathy for people, have compassion. And I think um, when they do that, it just makes them, you know, more well-rounded. And by traveling and doing those different things, they learn so much through other people's culture. And I think Hawaii is a great place for that. It's a great melting pot for so many different cultures. And I, I love that about this place. Totally. I love hearing all of that. And Michael, I, I heard that you were a, you worked as a lifeguard before. Yeah. Yeah, I can't beat the stereotype that black people can't swim. My <laughs> you know, people always say, well, I, nah, I was like that, and a lot of people in my neighborhood can swim. And I love being a lifeguard. It was one of my summer jobs, and um, I loved doing it because it was a time I got to be in the pool. I worked at a water park. I got to be in the water park for free. The only thing I didn't like was having to be a babysitter for my uh, brothers and sisters because <laughs> my parents were dropping off at my job. I was like, I was trying to get away from you guys <laughs> today, but that didn't happen. So uh, it was an opportunity to uh, have a good job, and, and I love swimming. It was something I like doing, and um, it was a great, it was fun. And then you you went on a full scholarship to Texas A and M yeah. for football. And after graduating A and M, what happened in the NFL draft? Man, I didn't get drafted, and to me that was a, a defining moment in my career because it's one of those things where something you put a lot of work in and it doesn't happen the way that you think it should happen and you have two choices you can fall down and just quit or you can stand up to the adversity of what was happening and for me my dad and my wife and and, and my my daughter I, I had too many people that were you know that i had too much support to just fold over i had to stand up and face the adversity and i knew that not being drafted would be a long road because it was one of the hardest things to do is to go and draft in the nfl because you don't have the same opportunity because they have less invested in you. Yeah. But when you invest in yourself, it doesn't matter how much people, other people invested in you because when you invest in yourself, that's when you get the most dividends. And for me, I invested in myself and it paid, it paid, it paid tremendous dividends because I dedicated myself to my craft. I put the work in and I knew that I wouldn't be denied, not only because the work that I put in, but because of the hunger. Yeah. I knew that if I went in and I didn't, res I respected everybody around me, but I didn't respect them at the same time. I respected them as people, but I did. I knew that I was the better player, and at the same time, it just made me a hungrier football player. And it had gave me a chip on my shoulder that I never really let go the whole time I was in the NFL. No matter how much success I had, I always wanted more, and I always felt like there was not enough, and they always doubted me, and it helped me. And, and I always said, when I didn't feel like I didn't have that chip anymore, it would be time for me to retire. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. That definitely get, keeps you motivated. I mean, you want to prove to everybody how, how great you can be. Yeah. So I got to say, Michael, you have to be the greatest non-drafted free agent the NFL has ever seen. Yeah. No, I, one of them, man, John Randall, some other guys, but I'm definitely up there. By yeah. Tony Romo and all those guys. Yeah. Per, Priest Holmes, and there's a lot of great guys, but I think those guys all have the same mindset when it came to accomplishing their goals. How could I, you know, be here, but my vision is there? Oh, yeah. And so, and the only way to do that is have a clear, you know, hyper-focus, as Coach Carroll would say, to be hyper-focused on your your agenda, what you think is your future and how you see yourself playing and into that role. And for me, I saw myself in those roles and I always saw myself, you know, being a great player. And I knew if I would um, put in the work, I could be that player. And then, so for me, being undrafted was another, you know, another wow. wall. But at the same time, we just jump over. Now, Michael, so at the Super Bowl with the Seattle Seahawks, why did you guys win? Why did you guys win that Super Bowl? It's because we respected, we respected Peyton Manning, we respected the organization, but at the same time, we didn't respect them mm. because we respected their work that they put in, but we knew we, we, didn't, we didn't respect anything else about it. We yeah. knew Tom, you know, Tom Brady, whoever it is, but Peyton Manning, 
we just knew that he put a lot of work in, but we were better. And I think that everybody around me, every single game, we had that collective thought that no matter what, we would respect those people, but we wouldn't respect them. Yeah. I know it sounds crazy, so I can know <laughs> around, But at the same time, when you get out there, we didn't care about the stats that they had before, the Pro Bowls, none of that. All we cared is about how are you going to compete with us today, and would you go farther than we would go? Would you play through injury? Would you do more for your teammate? And we knew that every single Sunday there would be a team that wouldn't do that because not only be because of the team we were, but because of the bond that we had, the amount of time that we spent with each other outside. And I think a great team is a team who can understand each other outside of what they do, regardless of if it's a sport or the job. It's when you spend time with your, you know, your teammates outside of the, the workplace that you can grow as a team. And I think for us, we understood that we experienced marriage together, we experienced death together, we experienced birth together. For us, they helped us soar as a team. And I think we had these kind of bonds that took us long beyond just the football field, but friends forever. Yeah, deep, very deep and very like loyal and very respectful, yeah. very trusting. So what was you guys' uh, team culture like? It was always about competing. I think Coach Carroll's number one thing is compete. Compete at a higher level, never complain. Um, there's always somebody that got it worse than you. And for we competed every single day, and I think that drove us to something um, that was great. I think we competed at a level on our team, but we had respect because sometimes coaches say compete, but they forget with athletes, you got to turn the compete off when they're on the same team sometime. Yeah. You got to make them realize they're on the same team. And some coaches can't do that. Coach Carroll's great at saying compete, but also remember that we're on the same team. We don't need to go farther than where we need to go than just making that play. We don't need to kick each other on the ground. We need to throw each other on the ground. We don't need to hit the quarterback. We need to compete at a high level, but understand to have respect for your teammates. And I think that's what was made us great because we competed every single day and we loved each other. So what... Why else was Pete Carroll such a great coach and still is a great coach? I think Coach Carroll always took the Google effect, I think. A lot of coaches don't take the Google effect. They try to find a way not to, uh, they're trying to find not the way to let a person be a human being. You know, they, they say things like, sell you. <laughs> they say things like, well, take away your humanity. And I think Coach Carroll always put your humanity first. Even though it was a business, he seemed to put your humanity first. And I think um, by doing that, he allowed people to be themselves. People would have a certain trust that they wouldn't have for other coaches. And I think Coach Carroll, by taking that Google effect and making it seem like you were in a safe place, making it seem that you were around family and being able to bring your family to work and all these different things, things that you would have to worry about when you were in, on other teams that you couldn't know what was going on. But when you had your family and the coaches and the wives all hang together, it was nice. And I think that's what made us such a great team because he understood the mindset and the philosophy uh, around the organization was family first, compete, and I think that's what made us great. Makes sense. Now, I have a question for you, Michael. As a defensive player, have you ever scored a touchdown? Yeah, I scored against the New Orleans Saints. Really? Really? Please remember that. <laughs> My best friend Cliff tipped the ball. I caught it, ran into the end zone. I was moving like that way behind me, but a little bit faster. <laughs> and like the trade winds were behind me. I was gone and I jumped into the end zone and I started dancing. And the crowd was crazy. Monday night football, you know how it is. That must have felt awesome. It felt awesome because this, Drew Brees is such a great quarterback. Yeah. And also just like... Um, it, it was a lot of all my teammates blocked for me, and that's very, very rare that everybody does their job on one play on the interception. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of another great quarterback, Tom Brady, what are your thoughts about Tom Brady? Why think, is he so great? I think Tom Brady, if you read his book or his his things that he does, I think his his dedication to his craft. I think you respect Tom Brady because you see the amount of work that he puts in. It's very rare that a person or a person trends up in their later years, most people start to trend down with their health. And I'm not just talking about sports in just general, whether it's relationships, the younger relationship, the better, the best it is, the <laughs> older it starts to go down. And he's finding a way to peak in the, the moments where everybody else seems to be declining. And I think that's what makes Tom Brady's great. He, he finds new ways to recreate himself. And everybody's not willing to recreate themselves. They're not willing to, you know, break their old habits. They're not willing to try something different. You know, they're just, ah, I used to do this this way. And I think, when you can be able to recreate yourself, but also let yourself evolve in a positive manner like Tom Brady's done, I think you can have that growth that he's had on the football field. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And Michael, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue going beyond football. Yes, yes. You're watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Super Bowl champion, Michael Bennett. We will be back in a quick minute.
Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, Stan, the energy man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan, the energy man, at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is one of the best players in the NFL who definitely makes an impact on the field, and he also makes a huge positive impact off the field. He is Super Bowl champion Michael Bennett, and today we are going beyond football. Michael, you're now with the Philadelphia Eagles. How is their team culture like right now? This is, you know, they're very similar. I think for me, uh, moving teams is always hard because you wonder, can you commit yourself? Can you do these different things? Can you you know, be the same player, can you love your teammates, all these different things. And coming into that locker room was really cool because it was a lot of great guys like Malcolm Jenkins, uh, Fletcher Cox, and guys that became really good teammates to me. And I, um, Chris Long, guys like Brandon Graham. So it was, it was cool. And there was an organization about competing, and, and uh, I loved that. So it was a great, a great organization. And Carson Wentz was a great guy, too. Yeah, no, it seems like you guys have so many great players and a lot of pieces that is necessary to get to the Super Bowl again. Yeah, we do. We have a lot of great guys. I think, um, you know, Carson was injured last week coming back, um, you know, getting Jay a drive back and guys like that. And I think it'll really prepare our chances to, you know, really reach that, you know, reach the chance to win it again. Yeah. I don't know what the Super Bowl is this year. Was it? I don't know. I was going to ask you. I don't know. It <laughs> might be Miami. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, I don't know what it's at, but we have a chance to get in there with the guys that we have and the defense line that we have and the linebacker core and get some corners back. We lost a lot of corners last year. We played with a lot of young guys. Yeah. I think that hindered us a little bit at the beginning of the season. Now, Michael, Coach Doug Peterson, what, what do you like about him as a coach and a leader? I think I like that Doug played. I think you have coaches who play, they understand – the workload, you know, they understand the time you spend away from your family. They understand all these different, you know, variables that happen to players that a lot of coaches don't understand because coaches haven't been players. And I think Doug has a, does a great job of, you know, tying in it to him being a coach and him used to being, used to be a player. And I think um, he does a great job of always believing. He's, he has a great heart. I think I respect him as a man because he always, you know, he, build, he believes in his team. He believes in his players, and not a lot of coaches believe in it. Every Sunday he goes out, and he believes in the guys around him, and I think his leadership is second to none. I think he was one of the best, second best guys, or one of the top guys. I think Coach Carroll was my favorite coach, and then Doug yeah. was second. Wow, that's that's high praise, because yeah. I know how high your standards are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, Michael, you read my book, Beyond the Lines, about a year ago. Yeah. How did you like the book? I love the book. I think the mindset of competing and keep winning and, and your thought process of all these different things, I think is super important because it's not only these things that apply to sports and people always take this idea that sport doesn't apply to real life. Yeah. Maybe real life doesn't apply to sport, but a, a sport <laughs> applies to real life exactly. because you do all these different things. You build these teams, you build these, um, these, these mantras or these ideas and um, this fellowship and how do you do this in life? And I think the, the way that you talk about it, the way that you, you know, with your feelings and the things that you achieved as a, as a coach and as a human, I think is really influential to my life, but a lot of other people. And I think that's why people are willing to come up here and talk to you because they understand that you've, you're not just talking the talk, you walk the walk. And yeah. I think that's super um, powerful. And I think um, Hawaii is lucky to have you because there's not <laughs> a lot of people out here that are willing to share that type of information to make people better. 
not just as um, players, but try to be making better as humans, especially young kids, because there's not a lot of uh, influence out here that have that positive influence for our children and our youth. And I think you definitely have that positive influence and that reach for our children. Well, Michael, talking about kids, I mean, your Bennett Foundation is absolutely amazing. And I want to, I mean, that's inspiring to me. I want to be like you. <laughs> no, no. Can you tell our viewers what you guys are doing with the Bennett Foundation? I think for me, like growing up and seeing athletes like Muhammad Ali and um, John Carlos and Dr. Harry Everts and all these different um, great influences as far as like, what do, what do you do as an athlete? Are you just, do you take yourself from humanity and just consider yourself just in this bubble of life where things are safe and you aren't willing to push yourself beyond your comfort zones to make yourself uncomfortable to things that are happening. And I think those people taught me that, you know, when you are an athlete, you have an obligation to your community, you have an obligation to society to use your platform in a positive way. And for me and my foundation, that's the most important thing is that is the true um, definition of me, the true yeah. definition of athlete to what we're supposed to do when we have this platform, when we have this reach. Our obligation is not to just sell products to people, not to just sell jerseys, not to just move and score touchdowns. It's to move people's emotions, just to move society's needle. It's to change um, our communities in positive manners. And for me, the Bennett Foundation is all about that. How do we put ourselves in position to share? And how do we push ourselves in position to inspire? How do we push put ourselves in position to be um, the leaders and teaching these young people behind us to be better leaders than where we were and the people that we had to look up to. And for me and my foundation is about food. It's about um, the issues that are happening in America right now. And I think right now the things that we're doing in Hawaii as far as like we're in, in our schools, our farm to table programs, we're into 30 schools teaching teachers how to you know, teach kids how to eat and families, how to farm and all these different things and nutrition and this healthy education. And that next thing that we're doing right now, we're just doing a new curriculum around breaking barriers or break, breaking barriers to social equity to different um, people around, whether it's Pacific Islanders, Asian history, um, Native American history, uh, women's equality, athletes and impact, um, um, black and white racial issues. Um, the women's um, issues and showing it how do we create a curriculum in schools for schools to have so we so our kids can be better equipped to understand other cultures because when we don't understand people we build we build up these walls literally yeah. building the wall yeah. <laughs> we build these walls because we don't want to be uncomfortable in things that we don't understand so our job as human beings are to build these um, comfort levels for other people to understand their culture respect their culture. Maybe we don't disagree with it, but we must respect them so we can have a better society. And I think that's what my foundation is about, pushing into these barriers, because there's a difference between philanthropy and activism. Philanthropy, to me, is things that happen to all of us because we're human beings. You know, cancer happens to a lot of us because we're human beings. Um, you know, death happens to us because we're human beings. Yeah. But activism and humanitarian work is things that happen to us because of the color of our skin, because of the gender that we are, and because of our choices um, as a male or a female, those things are things that we must be able to be at the forefront of as athletes and forefront as community leaders. And I think for me, that's what my foundation is about. So we do a lot of work in youth prisons and things like that and working with underprivileged people and kids. And, you know, we do, we do a lot of um, summits for young women uh, work around sexual assault, um, yeah. um, how do they become powerful women? Because, you know, as a, as a father of daughters, how do I show my daughters that I'm, I am committed to their plight as young women, how I'm committed to showing and showing them that I support things that are happening around them, not just by talking to talk, yeah. but also by walking the walk. So how do I create programs around things that are happening to them and things that are happening around society? And that's my main focus is, you know, being, leaving the world a better place than, then I got it. You know? And you and you definitely are, Michael. I mean, it's so inspiring. I mean, you inspire me to, yeah. you know, I want to do stuff like that too, yeah. to really help impact, you know, society and yeah. the world. Yeah. Now, a lot of people don't know that you are a New York Times bestselling author and yeah. <laughs> your book, um, Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. Yeah. I absolutely love that title. I have the book. I'm about halfway through the book right now. 
your brother Martellus wrote the foreword. It's yeah. amazing. Can you can you tell everyone what it's about? What compelled you to write it? Well, the book is just a play on words, but it's also about making not just making white people uncomfortable, but making us all uncomfortable. Yeah. I think there's certain things that we like to say that we're uncomfortable with, but we've been comfortable with, whether it's sexual assault, things that are happening around us, police brutality, different things that we say we're uncomfortable with, but they haven't changed because we're comfortable with yeah. them. So my book is about breaking down those barriers of our comfort level and making us uncomfortable to making changes in our society, whether it's you know, the women's issues and the women's march, police brutality, like I said, um, the issues that are happening in NCAA, the things that are happening with the PTSD and concussions, um, those things are things that I talk about in the book and talk about my own life and how to move forward and how do we make an impact in our society through athletics and not just as individual, but as collectively. And I think um, that's what the book is really about, is just breaking down these different barriers and, and figuring out, you know, my thought process on them, the things that I believe in. And, and, and I've done a lot of work. I've been to Indian reservations. I've been to all kinds of places around the world. Um, Haiti, all these different things, Africa, all these different things that I see um, from the water issues to, you know, just things that are happening in humanity. And you wonder, how can I, you know, have a voice and use my voice and prepare their voice and let them roar and, and work with the things that are happening and speak to the people who are listening and let them know that, you know, we have a voice. Our children have voice. Our children have voices. Our wives have voices. We have our voices as people. We have voices as a community. And we have to continuously, you know, push the issues that are happening around us. Because if we don't, they'll continuously happen. It's not to individuals come together and they say, this is not going to happen anymore. It's not to those things happen that we move forward in society. And I think me, um, that's what I really focus on in the book is talking about these things and showing that, you know, things are happening around us and we have to be able to pay attention to them. We have to be, get out of a bubble and, and see the world for things that are happening. Michael, I am, I am so happy that you wrote that book. And I mean, as I'm reading it, I'm, you remind, you're reminding me of like a Martin Luther King, actually. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. that. I mean, the insights that you have, it's, it's actually, a, I mean, it's so amazing. You know, it's because you know, I just like, you know, Martin Luther King and all these guys and um, who, all these different people who came to earth and you wonder like, why do they come to earth and why are they here to, why are they so brave, you know, why are they so brave to really put themselves out there to really want to see things change and, I'm not Martin Luther King, but, you know what I'm saying? but at the same time, I love his, his contribution to society. And I love all the contributions to people that are making things right now. You know, Barack Obama, all these different people that are, are doing things and who are really powerful in the way that they see community and the way that they see things changing. There's so many people who are here in Hawaii who are trying to make changes with food, education, all these different things that we should have as human beings. We should have equal education. We should have... Um, air conditioning in our schools, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I these totally are things agree. that uh, we we should have as human beings, and I think um, people around us that are keep fighting for those, it just you just look up to them and you just you just say bravo because a lot of people aren't willing to you know go beyond themselves. They're really selfish, and you wonder how these people become so selfless. And there's a lot of people out there who are like that. I gotta say bravo to you. I mean, Michael, you definitely go beyond the lines, yeah. and I want to thank you for Thanks. being on the show today and really sharing all those insights. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. No, and thank you for you're having You're an extraordinary person. You're very inspiring, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate you guys. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii, and a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit my website, RustyKamori.com, and my book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all Costco stores in Hawaii. I hope that Michael and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.